Hello friends, let's have a discussion of five marks questions from the famous play Pygmalion by George Bernard Shaw and the five marks questions answers you are supposed to write in a paragraph. Let's begin it. The question number one. Describe the flower girl. Bernard Shaw describes the flower girl Eliza as generally dirty with her hair in need of washing and her teeth in need of a dentist. She wears a suit covered hat shoddy and coarse clothing and boots that are much the worse for wear. All these items mark Eliza as a member of the lower class. Cleanliness, well cared for teeth, decent clothes cost money, not readily, not readily available to the poor. More than clothes or cleanliness, however, Eliza's cockney accent and unschooled vocabulary mark her as a lower class as higgins asserts that it's a curbstone english that will keep her in the gutter to the end of her to the end of her days question number two how does a note maker display his passion and respect for the english language the play begins at the portico of saint paul's church in london at 11 15 pm it's raining and so many pedestrians have taken shelter in the pet in the portico. There's one lady and her daughter and a daughter in evening dress. There's, a, there's one lady and a daughter in the evening dress. One man is sitting with his back to the rest, wholly preoccupied, completely preoccupied in writing in a notebook. An amiable military gentleman now comes in to take shelter there from the rain. The flower girl, Eliza, addresses him as a captain and appeals to him to purchase a flower. He has no change and gives her three pence. A bystander advises her to give a flower to the military gentleman for his three pence because there was a person sitting there who was noting down every word that she was saying. Eliza gets frightened. The crowd say that the man who is taking notes is a detective. Members of the crowd warn the girl against taking the money because there is a man behind, the, behind her taking notes of everything she says. When the flower girl Eliza loudly proclaims that, I'm a good girl, I am, the bystander begin to protest. The bystanders, they begin to protest. The note taker, it turns out the no it turns out the note taker is a professor Higgins, an expert in phonetics. His hobby is identifying everyone's accent and place of birth. He even maintains that he could take his he could take this ragmuffin of a flower girl and teach her to talk like a duchess in three months. Question number three. Why was the note taker Offended by the language of the flower girl, one bystander points out the note-taker's boots as proof that he is not an informer. The note-taker responds to his comments by asking him, now his family is doing in Selsley, in, in Selsey. The bystander is surprised and asks how the note-taker knows his family is from Selsey. The note-taker refuses to demystify his knowledge. Instead, he asked the flower girl how she has come so far east as she was born in Listen Grove. She's, up she's appalled and in tears. The note taker tells her to be quiet. Skeptical bystanders challenge the note taker to tell them where they are from and with which opportunity, with each opportunity, he more shockingly demonstrates his mysterious skill. Meanwhile, the flower girl pouts and insists that she's a good girl and the note maker is not a gentleman. The rain stops and the crowd begins to dissipate. The note taker offends the daughter and the mother but proceeds to call them a cab. However, the rain stops and they walk off to catch a bus. The gentleman, flower girl, and note taker, they just remain there. 
The gentleman asked the note taker how he does his trick. The note taker says that it's simply phonetics, which is his profession. He claims that he can place a man within six miles. The gentleman asks if he can make money as a as a phonetician. He responds that his clientele consists of those who want to refine their accents in order to move up the social the social ladder, and they will pay well for it. The flower girl has been muttering continually, and the note taker explosively tells her to shut up. She insists on a right to sit there. The note taker responds, "A woman who utters such depressing and disgusting sounds has no right to be anywhere, no right to live. Remember that you are a human being with a soul and the divine gift or agriculture." Oh, sorry, divine gift or articulate speech. That your native language is the language of Shakespeare and Milton and the Bible, and don't sit there crooning like a bilious pigeon. Question number four: Why was Mrs. Pierce apprehensive, apprehensive about worried about Mr. Higgins teaching Eliza? Mrs. Pierce. Higgins housekeeper initially describes Eliza as a very common girl with a dreadful accent and later reference refers to her as a foolish and ignorant her attitude towards Eliza is stern and dismissive however as plans for the experiment evolve her attitude softens and she becomes somewhat proactive sorry protective she can see that Higgins is consumed with the idea of teaching Eliza without any thought for the girl or for her future. She begs him to be reasonable and to think. You can't take a girl up like that as if you are picking up a pebble on the beach. Mr. Mrs. Pierce says her last effort to stop the experiment and return Eliza to her parents fails when Eliza explains. I have not, I aren't got no parents. Mrs. Pierce then attempts to get Higgins to focus on how the girl should be clothed, housed and cared for. She asks him to consider what is to become of her when you have finished, you and when you have finished your teaching, means to say, when you teach her complete English or the English, complete English, what will she become? What is to become of her when you have finished your teaching? That's a question. Mrs. Pierce asked Miss Mr. Higgins. Eventually, she sees she sees that it's best it's the best if she takes charge as best she can. By the time she has successfully given Eliza bath, she has warned Higgins about his bad language and asked him to curb his bad manners in front of the girl. After cleaning Eliza, Mrs. Pierce comes to Higgins. She tells him that if the girl is to be properly trained, he must not swear in her presence. He must not use the words like damn, what the devil, bloody, etc. And while having breakfast, he should not use his dressing gown as a napkin for wiping his hands. Higgins promises to behave well in her presence. Question number five. What was, what was Eliza's work for the next six months according to Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins says to Eliza, you are to live here for the next six months learning how to speak beautifully like a lady in a florist shop. If you are good and do whatever you are told, you shall sleep in a proper bedroom and have lots to eat and money to buy chocolates and take rides in taxis. If you're naughty and idle, you will sleep in the back kitchen among the black beetles and be well, be well loaded by Mrs. Pierce with a broomstick. At the end of six months, you shall go to Buckingham Palace in a carriage, beautifully dressed. If the king finds out you are not a lady, will be taken by the police to the Tower of London where your head will be cut off 
as a warning to other presumptuous flower girls. If you are not found out, you shall have a present of seven and sixpence, sixpence to start life with as a lady in a shop. If you refuse this offer, you will be a most ungrateful and wicked girl and the angels will weep for you. Question number six. What was Mr. Higgins' opinion on women and marriage? In Act 2, Pickering questions Higgins on his intentions toward Eliza. Higgins assures him they are entirely honorable, that he finds women jealous, exacting, suspicious and a damn nuisance. Women upset everything. Later in Act 3, when Mrs. Higgins voices the hope that her son is bringing home a young woman in whom he is romantically interested, Higgins replies, Oh, I can't be bothered with young women. My idea of a lovable woman is someone as like you as possible. These statements, these statements suggest that he is looking for the perfect woman, one who is a match for himself in intelligence and independence and with the strength and refinement of his mother. Yet, this model female will make no demands and change nothing in his life, while he himself is far from perfect. Higgins envisions an ideal for a marriage partner, much like the, myth the mythic sculptor Pygmalion for whom the play is named. Unable to find his ideal, he will remain a bachelor. Question number six, how is Mrs. Pierce's assessment of Mr. Higgins' contradiction to his own assessment or what's the significance of the contrast between Higgins' claim to be a shy, diffident man and Mrs. Pierce's assessment of him as overbearing? Answer is here. Both the questions can have the same answer. Higgins is an outward looking man. Keenly aware of others' shortcomings, blind to his own, he claims his claims follows his claims his claim follows a discussion with Mrs. Pierce in which she points out his need to curb his cursing and other bad habits in front of Eliza. She brings up she brings up each area needs improvement. Higgins becomes increasingly agitated, denying his faults to the point of yelling. He shocked when Mrs. Pierce responds, I hope you are not offended, Mr. Higgins, and then concedes that she is right to bring the matters to his attention. Moments later, he confines to Pickering, that woman has the most extraordinary ideas about me. She is firmly persuaded that I am an arbitrary, overbearing, bossing kind of person. I can't account for it. His statement reveals his lack of self-knowledge with, with regard to his nature. He has been rude and authoritarian in his treatment of Eliza and cross with Mrs. Pierce, yet views himself as an amiable sort of man. He acts without malice and is very ob obvious, oblivious to the effects, which accounts for his surprise when the ill effects are mentioned. Question number eight, write a note. Question number eight, write a note on the relationship between Eliza and Mr. Doolittle. Doolittle shows no paternal feelings toward Eliza. Suggesting that familial love and responsibility are also luxuries only the rich can afford, he and her six, sixth he and her sixth stepmother turned her out of the house to earn her own living. Doolittle has not seen for has not seen her for two months. He ex he ex he explains to Higgins that as a daughter she is not worth a keep. Describing his relationship with Eliza, 
in monetary terms. Doolittle's purpose in visiting Higgins is to see what money he can get out of Eliza's new situation in the house of Wimpole Street. As he says to Higgins, well, what's a five pound note to you? And what's Eliza to me? His attitude does not come as a complete surprise. Earlier, Mrs. Pierce tells Eliza to go home to her parents. Eliza's feelings about her parents are clear when she responds, I ain't got, I have not got any parents. They told me I was big enough to carry my own living and turned me out. Later, encountering her father after bath, she guesses correctly that he has not come out of fatherly concern but to touch Higgins for the money. After Doolittle leaves with his five pound note, Eliza firmly says in a turn where she sounds in a turn where she sounds like the parent, I don't never I don't want never to see him again. He's a disgrace to me. Question number nine. Why, according to Mr. Doolittle, did he deserve five, pound, five pounds? Alfred Doolittle deliberately asked for the money for the purpose of spending it all and having a grand time over the weekend. He's quite open about this. Saying to Higgins, he says, don't you be afraid that I'll save it and spare it and live idle on it? He seems almost proud of the way that he promises that there that there will not be penny of it left by Monday. He wants the money for one good spree. Thus, it is when Higgins offers him ten pounds, it's Doolittle who says he could not possibly accept it because of the way this is too big a sum and cannot be spent easily. Now, let's note here what he says to justify his refusal to the greater sum of money Doolittle says, 10 pounds is a lot of money. It makes a man feel prudent like, then goodbye to happiness. You give me what I ask you. Governor says, not a penny more, not a penny less. Above all, there's one thing that Doolittle wants to avoid, that is his feeling prudent which he sees as being akin to waving goodbye to happiness, having too much money, having too much money would make him think he would have to save it and that he was unable to spend it on enjoying himself. Five pounds appears to be, appears to be the optimum amount to be easily wasted on a weekend of pleasure. Thus, Alfred Doolittle is happy to accept five pounds because this is the amount that he can most easily spend on a weekend of pleasure. He does not want to feel prudent by having, <coughs> excuse me, he doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to feel prudent by having too much money. Question number 10. What were Mrs. Higgins concerned with respect to Eliza? Higgins is a professor of phonetics. Eliza is a student. He is cynic towards Eliza. He is indifferent towards her beauty and charm. He loves his subject like anything. Here, his role is that of creator. He transforms a poor flower girl into a beautiful lady. He is using Eliza in his experiment. He wants intellectual satisfaction from her. That's why, after the ambassador's party, Higgins overjoyed on Eliza's success. He boosts on his success. He doesn't think about Eliza's feelings. Eliza expects emotional satisfaction from him. His lessons changed Eliza into a strong, willed woman. Higgins appears a weak, willed person. So these two characters are the two poles apart. Question number 11. How is the superficially of class distinctions based on language brought out in the play? An important lesson that has been learned throughout 
life and the beginning of the time is to respect the individual's content, not the image. It's shown throughout George Bernard Shaw's play Pygmalion that different people can be brought together in the same circumstance, being a heavy rain shower in London, but distance themselves so effusively because of outer appearances. The situation between the non-intellectual flower girl and sophisticated pickering, Higgins, and the mother-daughter is drawn out over the judgment of a poor speech and a value as a person as she constantly defends herself against their prejudice. Banasha uses Pygmalion to show how language shallowly reflects the importance of social classes within the Victorian era through the portrayal of characters, the conflicts, and the transformation in the first act of the play. The characters introduced in the beginning of the play prove to illustrate the relationship between social classes and the expectations of each other. The character's situation within the story shows its importance in the context and is able to define his or her, his or her social standing. For example, the mother expects others to do things for her, showing her societal role as a woman who chooses not to help others. You really are very helpless, Freddy. Go again. Don't come back until you have found a cab. She's able to show her class authority in a ladylike manner while presenting how she believes she should be treated by belittling, belittling the value of those who are not respecting that. Eliza presents her role as a lower class member of society when she's knocked into by Freddy. So the characters prove themselves through their speech to belong to their appropriate classes. The transformations are seen from the young girl who is still in training alongside her already sophisticated mother, alongside her sophisticated mother and the, the impact Higgins' criticism has had on Eliza. So to conclude, it establishes that society, social classes themselves are superficial and to judge on the content of character will always be more important than imagine on the outer surface. So hence we can say that Banar Shah's Pygmalion depicts the division of social classes through language. Question number 12, how impressive was, was Eliza at the reception? Eliza's first test is at a luncheon given by Mrs. Higgins. Eliza, who is well-dressed, makes a remarkable impression on the lunch guest. They are, they are totally taken by her, especially by her confidence, demeanor and articulation. Eliza can only carry a conversation based on the two topics, weather and health. When these fail her, she slips back and appears insecure. After being presented in London society at a garden party, a dinner party, and the reception at Buckingham Palace, Eliza succeeds. Both Pickering and Higgins agree that, oh, she was not nervous, I knew, she would be all right. Question number 13. Why did Nepomuk, why did Nepomuk think Eliza was fraud? Eliza is received by the ambassador and his wife who are struck by the beautiful gravity of a pronunciation. As she passes to the drawing room, she, the hostess instructs Nepomuk to find out all about her. Eliza's strangely attractive self and magnificent dress and jewels dazzle everybody in the drawing room where the reception is in, is in full swing. Higgins, who has grown quite cynical of the whole affair, joins the group of the host and hostess who are now mingling among the guests. Nepomuk soon joins them too. He announces quite dramatically that Eliza Doolittle is fraud. According to him, Doolittle can't be her real name since it's an English name and Eliza is not English. 
He reasons that he thinks only foreigners have been taught to speak well. He is convinced that Eliza is Hungarian and of royal blood since only royalty can produce that aura of divine right and resoluteness of purpose. When asked for his opinion, Higgins bluntly replies that he thinks that she is on she is an ordinary London picked out of Drury, Drury, Drury Lane and taught to speak by an expert. However, the others refuse to believe this and agree with Nepomuk that she must be a princess at least, although not necessarily, not necessarily legitimate. Question number 14. What is the result of the letter written to Ezra Wanafella? Higgins wrote a letter to a man named Ezra D. Wanafella saying that Doolittle was the most original moralist in England and the man died and left a large part of his wealth for founding an oral reform world league and he left £3,000 per year to Alfred Doolittle on the condition that he should deliver as many as lectures as they can they ask him to deliver up to six times a year. This had made him gentlemen. Up till now, he used to ask others for money. Now, others are asking him for money. When he was poor, he had only two or three relatives. Now he has 50. He has to live for others, not for himself. He has become the victim of middle class morality. Eliza must have gone to his house to ask for money. And now Higgins will make money from him by teaching him middle class language instead of proper instead of his proper english question number 15 according to mrs higgins what were the mistakes of mr higgins and mr pickering for eliza or towards eliza according to mrs higgins they should have not given eliza's name to the police as if she was a thief or lost have lost an umbrella they have no more sense than two children. Mrs. Higgins comments that Eliza worked hard and gave an admirable performance at the ambassador's party, but both Higgins, both Higgins and Pickering took the entire credit to themselves and thanked God that it was all over. They should have thanked her, petted her, and told her how splendid she had been. They did nothing of the kind, and so she was naturally annoyed. Question number 17. What changes do we see in Mr. Doolittle's appearance and attitude throughout the play? When Eliza's father, Alfred Doolittle, is introduced in the Act 2, he wears the grubby grab of dustman, that is garage man, sorry, that is garbage man, and identifies himself as a proud member of the undeserving poor. When he appears in the Act 5 at the home of Mr. Sorry, Mrs. Higgins, he wears the top quality clothes of a wealthy gentleman on his way to get married. The physical contrast is clear, and Doolittle explains that he has come into money in the amount of £3,000 a year. However, this is as far as his transformation goes. Higgins had brought Doolittle to the attention of the former dustman's benefactor, that is an American millionaire. Therefore, Doolittle blames the professor for his new condition, exclaiming, See here, do you see this? You done this. Unlike his daughter, Doolittle does not appreciate the imposed rise in status and has no desire to change who he is to conform to societal standards. As a dustman, he was happy and free. Now he feels forced to he feels forced by his new position to act more respectably to act more respectably, and he sees himself as a victim of middle-class morality 
lacking the courage to reject the yearly inheritance he laments happier man than me will call for my dust and touch me for the tip and i look on helpless and envy them despite his appearance despite his apparent wealth and status dolittle will remain a dustman at the heart question number 17 why does eliza with higgins had left where he found her so the place where he found her and the same place higgins had left her at the same place in the same position why the experiment is over eliza has successfully been passed off as a member of the social elite however as mrs higgins predicted in the act 3 eliza now finds herself thrust into a new social status with manners and habits that disqualify a fine lady from earning her own living now she can't do anything instead of entering a future full of possibilities eliza is facing one in which her options are reduced to marriage in order to achieve financial security she has become a product to sell or a doll to be passed on to new corner we were above that at the corner of the tottenham court road and court i sold flowers she said i i sold flowers i didn't sell myself eliza asserts the morality of the lower class that the upper class does not possess eliza has never lost the sense of respectability that sparked her to proclaim i'm a good girl i am had higgins left her where he found her she at least would not be pressed to compromise this closely had this closely held value question number 18 why did eliza think freddy was a better choice to marry eliza in banarsha's play chose freddy because she could see that he cared for her deeply and would be sure to take care of her that's important because before eliza came to higgins for lessons she was destitute in banarsha's words eliza likes freddy and she likes the colonel and but she does not like higgins or mr dolittle she says that she cannot marry a low common man after seeing the lives of the two cultured men but she would marry freddy as soon as she was able to support him she says freddy loves me that makes him king enough for me she does not want to be treated as an equal as one of the boys the way higgins treats everyone he respects she has no interest in the higher life eliza does want a little kindness the simple love and affection that only and only freddy hill can supply that's why freddy was the right choice for eliza to marry unlike higgins who wants to change the world eliza wants only to change herself unlike higgins who can and does stand apart from the common aspects of life eliza can be content with freddy who simply needs and wants her as a compassionate human being and whereas higgins can get along without anyone eliza and freddy need each other in contrast higgins will continue to try to improve the world but eliza will make a comfortable home for herself and freddy question number 19 comment on the ending of the play george banarsha concludes pygmalion with a define with a defining fight between two main characters that's eliza and higgins eliza firmly stands up to higgins bullying while pondering about what she is going to do with her life higgins continues his usual pessimism and insults while subtly asking eliza to stay with him the act is wrapped up when as eliza departs higgins gives her a shopping list despite her confirmed independence in the previous conversation 
she sarcastically responds back with an advice on the items of his given list and retorts something along the lines of gi gi what will you do without me and with that leaves she leaves higgins then laughs at eliza's proposal to to freddy convinced that she will come back crawling to him last question higgins mother of write a short not on mrs higgins or we can say character sketch of mrs higgins higgins mother mrs higgins is an intelligent and independent woman with a high position in society she hosts the ensford hills at her rich home even though the woman is truly upset with eliza's presence and she's always kind to her she merely knows what it means to be a woman in london of those times and she's afraid of the future that waits for eliza even more she does her best to explain to the son that eliza is not an object or his possession and that he must treat her equally to others taking into account her feelings the mother also <clears throat> the mother also truly loves her son although she is truly upset with his manners language behavior from some points of view mrs higgins is a traditional mother figure who cares the most about his son she tries throughout the story to warn the son of the consequences of his actions one more fact that proves that mrs higgins is, is truly a kind and sympathetic person is that eliza listens to her when she wants good advice from an old lady she feels that the lady is sincere with her desire to help and find the support talking with her about their problems so this is how friends i have solved the five marks questions from the play pigmalion written by george bernard shaw dear friends thank you so much for watching this video you can reach me at mukeshenglish@gmail.com please do subscribe the channel click on the like button for more videos on literature workbook pronunciation grammar communication skills presentation skills interview skills stay in tune with mukesh english thank you once again